Okay, I think we have leveled off and we will get started with our event this Friday afternoon. I'm delighted uh, to be here. My name is Chris Griffin. I'm a faculty member here at the College of Law and uh, thankful to my colleague, Professor Andy Cohen for <clears throat> inviting me and giving me the chance to moderate this wonderful conversation between two of the country's foremost experts on election law and policy. We have Ned Foley, who is uh, not only a member of the Ohio State Law Faculty, but uh, lucky for us, a distinguished visitor here at the College of Law. And we also have Justin Levitt from Loyola Law School. Um, you really can't get a better duo than these two to talk about the decision in Trump versus Anderson. And uh, we're going to have a conversation about the opinions that were released. I'm going to start by introducing briefly our two guests, and then giving a, a brief factual overview of the Anderson decisions, and then jumping into the conversation. Uh, after that, we will leave some time for audience Q&A, both here in person and on Zoom. So Professor Ned Foley holds the Ebersole Chair in Constitutional Law at The Ohio State University, where he also directs its election law program. He is currently a Guggenheim Fellow, and as I just mentioned, for spring 2024, a distinguished visitor at the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers College of Law. Uh, Professor Foley's most recent book, Presidential Elections and Majority Rule, was published in 2020 by Oxford University Press, and it investigates the philosophical premises of how the Electoral College is supposed to work, as revised by the 12th Amendment to the Constitution, and uses that historical analysis to suggest reforms for the college to operate in a more majoritarian fashion. Professor Foley has served as a reporter for the American Law Institute's Project on Election Administration and has co-authored the book Election Law and Litigation, the Judicial Regulation of Politics. In addition to a regular Washington Post opinion column, uh, Professor Foley has op-eds and other essays that have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Politico, and Slate, among other publications. Professor Foley clerked for Chief Judge Patricia Wald of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and Justice Harry Blackman of the U.S. Supreme Court. He has also served as state solicitor in the office of Ohio's Attorney General, where he was responsible for the state's appellate and constitutional litigation. He is a graduate of Columbia University School of Law and Yale College. Second, we have Professor Justin Levitt, who is a nationally recognized scholar of constitutional law and the law of democracy at Loyola Marymount University's Loyola Law School. He returned to Loyola after serving as the White House's first senior policy advisor for democracy and voting rights in 2021 and 2022. Professor Levitt previously served as a deputy assistant attorney general in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. And at DOJ, he primarily supported the Civil Rights Division's work on voting rights and protections against employment discrimination. Professor Levitt has published widely, including in the law reviews at Harvard, Columbia, NYU, Georgetown, and William & Mary, among others. He served as a visiting faculty member at the Yale Law School, USC's Gould School of Law, and at Caltech. He was Loyola's assistant associate dean for research from 2017 to 2020, and was honored to receive Loyola's Excellence in Teaching Award in 2013-14 and 2019-20. Professor Levitt has been invited to testify before committees of the U.S. House and Senate, the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, several state legislative bodies, and both federal and state courts. His research has been cited extensively in the media and in the courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court. He maintains the website All About Redistricting, which tracks the progress, the process of state and federal redistricting around the country, including litigation. Professor Levitt served as a law clerk to the Honorable Stephen Reinhardt, of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He holds a law degree and a master's in public administration from Harvard University and was an articles editor of the Harvard Law Review. Please join me in welcoming our two special guests. So as I said, I'm gonna give a brief overview of Trump v. Anderson. Uh, you will remember very well that we were delighted to have Professor Foley not that long ago, just over a month ago, a few days before the oral arguments were taken in the case, and that was on February 8th of this year. And within a month of those arguments, on March 4th, the court released a per curiam opinion 
the central holding of which commanded the agreement of all nine justices on the court. And that holding in the court's words was, and I quote, states may disqualify persons holding or attempting to hold state office, but states have no power under the Constitution to enforce Section 3 with respect to federal offices, especially the presidency, close quote. The court spends much of that main opinion discussing how our federalist system of government would require an explicit grant of a disqualifying authority to the states. But the Constitution does no such thing under its view. In addition, the court understands the 14th Amendment as severely limiting, certainly not enhancing state power. After all, it was passed in the Reconstruction era to prevent states from bridging the rights of formerly enslaved persons. The opinion of the court also takes a historical lens to note that there was no tradition after 1868 of states using Section 3 to disqualify federal office holders or candidates for office, only such people at the state level. We are therefore to infer that if states didn't wield this authority, they must have refrained because they understood that the Constitution didn't vest the states with that authority. The court also reviews the structure of the 14th Amendment, and specifically the relationship between Section 3, which is the disqualifying provision, and Section 5, which allows Congress to pass, quote, appropriate legislation to enforce the amendment's terms. The court quotes from Senator Trumbull of Illinois as observing that the Constitution provided no enforcement mechanism by its own terms, and so required, quote, a bill to give effect to the fundamental law embraced in the Constitution, close quote. And it really was this wading into the relationship between Section 3 and Section 5 of the 14th Amendment that divided five justices from the remaining four. The one point on which all nine agreed, however, was a really practical argument that allowing states to decide federal qualifications for office would create, and I'm going to have a long block quote here, a result in which a single candidate would be declared ineligible in some states, but not others, based on the same conduct and perhaps even the same factual record. This patchwork that would likely result from state enforcement would sever the direct link that the framers found so critical between the national government and the people of the United States as a whole. Nothing in the Constitution requires that we endure such chaos, arriving at any time or different times, up to and perhaps beyond the inauguration, close quote. Justice Barrett penned a very short concurrence, stating that she wouldn't have reached the issue of whether federal legislation is the sole vehicle for Section 3 enforcement and ended on a somewhat hopeful note, emphasizing that the court was unanimous in the main view that states do not have the right to disqualify candidates from federal office. The three justices of the progressive wing, that would be Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson, they went further in bemoaning the court's opinion for, quote, shutting the door on other potential means of federal enforcement, close quote. They also point to a tension between the disability removal provision, which just says that if there is a disqualification, then a two-thirds vote of each chamber of the legislature could remove that disqualification. Uh, the tension between that and the fact that only a simple majority would be, would be required to either pass enforcing legislation or conversely to block it. And these justices saw Section 3 as really self-executing, meaning that it didn't require any additional legislation passed under Section 5. Um, so that is a quick overview of what is contained in the opinions. I've, of course, glossed over all of the background that Professor Foley uh, very uh, nicely provided to us back in February. I'm sure we all remember that. So um, I will start first asking our guests, Professor Foley and Levitt, did I leave anything out of that overview that you think is material to our discussion of Trump v. Anderson today? Well, thanks, Chris. Um, I guess I wish I could be there in person, but delighted that we're having this discussion. And it's great to be on the same program with Justin, who I've known for ages and ages and enjoyed our friendship. So thanks for convening this. Um, so I thought that was a great summary. The only thing I would add to kind of frame what we may want to talk about is we could both critique the decision and the reasoning, um, which is sort of backwards looking. It is what it is now that we have it. 
but then we could also be forward looking and saying what's its implications uh, in the future, including for this election still to unfold. Uh, this idea that Congress has to be the one to enforce Section 3 with respect to federal officials, including the president, um, is critical for thinking about where we are now and where we might be as we approach November and beyond. Um, and the relationship between Section 5 legislation, Chris, as you mentioned, versus other mechanisms, potential mechanisms of congressional enforcement are left, in my judgment, opaque, but really important to consider. Uh, unfortunately, it's an important, it's a difficult topic, even though it's important, there's a lot of technical complexities, which we may have to unpack, but I would flag uh, really those two uh, boxes, if you will, the backward looking box of critiquing the decision and the forward looking box of trying to figure out what its implications are. And I'll just add uh, my thanks to you, uh, Chris, for putting together the program and for everybody there for listening to it. I'm also delighted to be here with you all and with Ned. When I when I first met Ned, I had hair. And so that'll just give you a sense of how long it's been. Um, the only thing I'll add to, to Ned's, uh, not tweak, but addition, um, is you said everything exactly as the opinion reads, Professor Griffin. But to Ned's point, what Congress does going forward may reveal some of that to be dicta and the court might or might not hold on to all of the words that it explained, right? That was part of the critique of the dissents, as you pointed out. And so exactly what Congress has to do next wasn't at issue in the case at all. This was entirely about a state court uh, taking action without Congress having done anything. And I think... Uh, whether you can take the court seriously in the notion that legislation might be next is an open question, even though it unquestionably said so. Um, and that that hints, I think, to part of what Ned's getting at and the what happens next, where do we go from here questions that still arise after this opinion. But as far as describing what the court said and why it said what it said, nothing to add for me. I appreciate that very much. Uh, we will start off the conversation with doing something that uh, law students and even legal academics love to do, which is really um, guess at what is going on behind that curtain with the nine <laughs> justices. And I'm going to start with a very straightforward thing, connecting Anderson with perhaps Bush v. Gore from literally 24 years ago, in which the opinion for the court is a per curiam decision. Do you think, or could you explain what you believe the significance of that choice is rather than to have a single justice named as the author of the opinion for the court? Well, again, to jump in, um, I would say the goal of the per curiam initially was probably to signal two things. One, that this is a fast moving case uh, and therefore um, you, the court is gonna just signal that uh, it may not be the same uh, deliberateness as, as a regularly argued case. Uh, I think that's true of both Bush versus Gore. And even though this one wasn't quite as speedy, it was pretty speedy by the court standards. The other thing is, I, I think, um, given the fact that there was a unanimous uh, disposition and judgment, I think uh, the hope was that they could get all nine justices on a single opinion, even if there might be some additional concurrences to add something, at least all nine would sign the per curiam. That was probably the goal. Uh, obviously that failed. Um, and I think that there are some tea leaves to read about the back and forth that went between the majority. And, you know, I, I think Justin correctly calls it a dissent, <laughs> uh, at least a partial dissent, even though, um, you know, they, one of the reporters was able to look at some metadata and discovered that it was initially labeled a dissent, at least in part, until uh, they cleaned it up and tried to call it a concurrence in part, but it reads as a dissent. And I think that's part of the tea leaves uh, to think that there was probably a different draft of the con of the per curiam uh, that was balked at by the progressives. The majority tried to change it to accommodate and didn't accommodate enough and kind of were left scratching the hair that we don't have uh, to figure out exactly what was said initially 
and what to make of where we are at the moment. Yeah, Ned's right, of course. The the uh, opinion I referred to is, in fact, a concurrence, but it, sh it sure reads like a, a dissent to the reasoning or a concurrence in the judgment. Everybody's on board that Colorado couldn't have done what it did, but there's some pretty striking words uh, for where the court went that at least several justices are unhappy with. Um, I also want to call attention to the speed that struck me as well in the comparison to Bush versus Gore. The court doesn't do its best work in a hurry. Um, the students in the room know that you start a paper the night before and it might not be the best piece you've ever produced. And the court feels the same way. And I think this opinion would read differently. Um, same result, unquestionably the same result, but I think it would read differently if the court had another couple rounds where it felt that it could continue to deliberate, continue to refine, continue to draw, maybe even get all nine justices on the same opinion as as Professor Foley suggests. Um, there are a few oddities in the opinion that I think would have been hammered out. It's why I say I'm not sure how closely the court would hold to the, the dicta in the future as situations arise. There are a few things that are underexplained, um, and there are a few comparative inconsistencies um, that the court doesn't justify. And my suspicion is that given another month or two to, to work through the kinks, you'd have seen a, a, a differently styled opinion and maybe a differently phrased opinion, but without question, the same results. This was It was clear from the argument that this was going to be probably 9 nothing and maybe 8-1 at the best uh, when it came down. And Professor Levitt, do you think that the speed with which this was generated um, really does point to the, the main reason that we have the three justices technically concurring but seeming to dissent over the fact that they believe that the court went too far in answering or attempting to answer other questions that did not need to be answered given the actual question presented to the court? Do you think that the haste in the court's action also really undermined its attempt to work out the extent to which congressional action is the exclusive vehicle for disqualification. Some of it. Um, so I think the the concurrence, the, the dissent, um, the, the discurrence uh, points out a, a few of the things that the court did, some of which I think were intentional and would have been in the opinion in any event, and some of which I think might have been subject to this further refinement I talk about. One of those things I suspect is cutting off the potential for individual plaintiffs to come to a federal court after, let's say, uh, the former president is reelected. If Congress isn't the decider, then individuals who were harmed by a future action of returning President Trump could challenge his qualification to hold office in federal court. And I think it's pretty clear the majority wanted to say no way to that without further congressional action, right? They don't want to hear a slew of cases coming from individuals saying you can't punish, injure, harm me in the following ways because you, the president, are not qualified to hold office without something from Congress intervening. It made clear that Congress has to be, as it put it, the decider in deciding how the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment would be applied to particular people for federal office holders. Um, I think part of the uncertainty is that the court seems to put an awful lot of weight on Section 5, as Professor Foley mentioned, as you mentioned, um, in suggesting that Congress has to legislate that applicability. And I that's the part that I'm considerably less sure of. If members of Congress exercise their authority to find facts suggesting a disqualification of Donald Trump, for example, um, outside of the process of legislation, then Congress would still be the body deciding, just not through the process of lawmaking. And I honestly don't know how much weight the court would put on the fact that it said legislation in the event that Congress decided the matter outside of the legislative process. So abundantly clear that it's cutting off the individual one-off lawsuit to say, you can't put me in jail because you're not qualified to be president. But Congress is a co-equal branch, and it's not clear that the court really means to be telling Congress how it has to make that decision. 
I think. Thank you. Uh, Professor Foley, I think both you and I were surprised after reading the opinion for the court about the methodological approach taken, um, namely that you would perhaps expect with a commanding 6-3 majority uh, of justices, many of whom are clearly originalists in their thinking and analysis, that it it deviates from a standard originalist take um, compared to some recent decisions. And instead, it's um, much more of a consequentialist approach, especially in looking at the argument that there would be a patchwork of decisions if if they allowed Colorado and any other state to make a one-off decision. Could you say more about that and um, why you think the court either blended some historical analysis with this consequentialist approach or really was hanging its hat on the consequentialist approach? Sure. I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, and I think there's a nice uh, essay in the New Yorker magazine by Jill Lepore, who's a Harvard historian and now also a member of the law faculty at Harvard, sort of making this point. So, you know, I encourage anybody who has access to the New Yorker website um, to, to check that out. Uh, I, I, th I think the, the court is trying to pretend, if I can say that, that this is an originalist decision. Um, but it's not. It is, I think, thoroughly consequentialist. Uh, I think the court was really concerned about making sure that it didn't have to pronounce one way or the other on whether uh, Trump is or is not disqualified by Section 3. And it, it did want to reach the result that neither Colorado nor any other state uh, could do this on its own. And I, I think it it tried to dress up its uh, result-oriented uh, approach here with as, as best an argument as it, it could. Um, it is true, you, Chris, you correctly pointed out that the Reconstruction was this you know, awful moment of American history, at least the failure of Reconstruction was awful when the, the South was able to get away with undoing all of the civil rights um, efforts that uh, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment were designed to implement. Uh, and that is a, an important backdrop to uh, the role of Section 3 and the role of the court and the concept of federalism. That That's all true, but it, it that doesn't negate the fact that even with the desire on the part of the Reconstruction Congress to make sure to try to make sure that civil rights were to be enforced in the former Confederate states, there was still a lot of federalism left over uh, from the original constitution, including particularly in the electoral college mechanism. And we can see that in the presidential election of 1868, which was the very first one immediately after the ratification of the 14th amendment. And one of the way the pro Reconstruction Republican Party at the time, the party of Lincoln, the party of Lysses Grant, the party of winning the Civil War and we, um, you know, having the freedom, the emancipation and, and the 14th Amendment was they wanted to make sure that Ulysses Grant won the 1868 election <laughs> and not the Democrats who were the traitors in the eyes of the Republican, even Northern Democrats who were not fully on board with with the wars as Lincoln and Grant had fought it and so forth. And one of the ways that they did that was to use the power of state legislatures in Article II of the original constitution and the, and the electoral college mechanism to get their way. So for example, the state of Florida, which at the time, even though it was in the South, was under military occupation by Grant's troops and, and, and the reconstruction movement, um, that legislature said, we're going to appoint our electors directly to, to make sure that Grant wins and the Democrats don't. Now, that's not technically a ruling on the Section 3 issue, but it's exactly the kind of the so-called patchwork that the current court anachronistically calls chaos. It calls chaos, right? I mean, in other words, Florida says we're not going to have citizens vote to appoint presidential elections because electors because we want to know the result. Other states contemplated that because they had the power to do so, decided that they didn't need to do so. Um, but each state kind of went its own way in figuring out how to um, appoint electors for this most consequential election right after the adoption of the 14th Amendment. 
So I hate to you know, cr critique the court. I respect the justices. They're very smart. They work hard. They try their best. But they kind of really blew it here on the history. Um, and uh, it, that just is, is what it is. So to answer your question, um, they tried to claim it as being originalist, but it, it's not. And I think it is definitely consequential or consequential. And I, if Please. I can add a, a tiny bit to that. Yeah. Um, I, I agree entirely with uh, what Professor Foley said. Also, there are some oddities in consequentialism that it adopts and some oddities in the Federalist structural argument that it adopts. So uh, RFK is going to be on the ballot in some states and not others. And that's fine. That's not chaos. That's the system of every state choosing its electors and deciding how it's going to apportion its electors in its own way, according to ballot access laws. There's a federal floor, but states have differences in that federal floor. Um, and the court has never suggested that there needs to be uniformity in the presidential candidates offered to the public across the nation. Um, and I think doesn't actually believe that there needs to be uniformity in the presidential candidates across the nation. Of course, it's a different matter when you're dealing with the nominee of a major party, but that's by virtue of the major party's machinery and not by virtue of uh, some federalist notion. Um, on the other end, the court said, and I think means that this is about federal office holders, that states have no power to, uh, to make these decisions with respect to federal office holders, which includes members of Congress, even though there would be no patchwork, right? Members of Congress are going to be sitting, going to be representing one state and a state Supreme Court decision on whether somebody is on or off the ballot is the final word for that particular member of Congress regardless. And I think the court glosses over that. Um, it never mentions members of Congress. It says federal office holders because it's providing what appears to be a, a federal principle that the 14th Amendment doesn't permit states to make this decision with respect to federal candidates. But one of the big reasons that the court got there is to avoid some states deciding that uh, that former President Trump is disqualified and some states deciding that he's qualified. That's not a problem when it comes to seating uh, or putting on the ballot members of Congress or, or senators. Um, court never mentions that. And that's another yeah, one that's of these things that I think in in a slower opinion uh, or more deliberate opinion and more rounds, they might have, have given a little bit more attention to. I want to pick up a little bit more of what you were just saying, Professor Levitt, that, um, you know, it, to the extent that we look at the constitutional framework as a, a set of principles and guidelines for main for dealing with in a structure where we have a central federal government and governments at the state level dealing with the externalities that can be created by individual state action in the totality of the United States, that is there a principal difference between the example you just raised of RFK being on different states' ballots, but not all, insofar as I would understand that to be whether or not he qualifies through a number of signatures to get on the ballot, right? That that is a reflection of the popular will of the people of those jurisdictions, whereas a Colorado or any other state Supreme Court being able to disqualify somebody is removing the possibility that popular will could be expressed at the ballot box. Does that help um, explain why the court may think, yeah, I agree with you, it's okay for RFK to be only appearing in a patchwork of state ballots, but it is not okay for one jurisdiction to, if it were Georgia or Pennsylvania, that could decide the election itself. I don't know is the answer. And that's because I'm not sure how the court's logic applies. Very confined to 14th Amendment, very confined to Section 3. There are other qualifications that deprive the people of their popular will to elect a candidate, right? You can't elect a candidate who's too young, you can't elect a candidate who's not a natural born citizen, you can't elect a candidate who's already served two terms. Those all take the uh, the authority out of the voters' hands by virtue of a constitutional provision designed to take that authority out of the people's hands. And the court doesn't speak to whether the same principles that it grounds in the 14th Amendment's peculiar structure and history Right. This was designed, the court says, to take power away from the states, exactly as you said, Professor Griffin, in the aftermath of the Civil War, when they were showing themselves to be bad actors, the 14th Amendment is designed to limit state authority. Those other qualifications 
don't live in portions of the constitution that were similarly designed. And so that rationale doesn't necessarily apply. I think as a practical matter, the 14th Amendment Section 3 provision is, it's not unique, but it certainly stands apart. Um, the question of whether somebody is a natural born citizen is not a, a question that's free of dispute, but it relies on a set of facts that seems to me different in kind than the set of facts that you need to determine whether somebody has engaged in insurrection. That latter set of facts is much more of a political judgment. And I don't mean that to say a partisan issue. Um, it's a judgment of the polis, of the community, about whether somebody has posed a risk to the republic. And so it, it, I think it is appropriate to save that decision for a body that represents the commensurate public, for a federal body to, rep to make that decision for a federal candidate, for a state body to make that decision for a state candidate. But all of that is reasoning that you don't see in the opinion anywhere, right? That's, that's my gloss on how the case might otherwise have come out in an alternative world. Similar result, but not using the court's own logic. So my answer to your question is, I don't know, because I don't know how I'd reconcile that with the other qualifications that don't have the same limit. Perfectly fair. Perfectly fair. Uh, Professor Foley, I know you've thought about uh, this question, and I'm interested in your thoughts on it, uh, about whether you think the Anderson opinion tells us that Congress has the power to disqualify, in this immediate case, former President Trump after the election. So let's say he were to win the Electoral College. Um, do we have any tea leaves to suggest that Congress would have the power to use Section 3 after the election? And do you also see that as really a political question as opposed to a uh, legal constitutional question, um, meaning should Congress do that even if we believe the court has given them implicitly the authority to do that? Yeah, thanks for asking that, because I do think that's a really important thing to focus on. And, and I'm going to get there if it's okay by by picking up on some of the things that Justin said in response to your earlier question, because I, I think um, there's a path we should take to, to analyze this key point. Um, first, on the issue of, of uniformity, and, and the, is the RFK example similar or different, um, one thing that it's important to recognize is that if this court in Anderson had been willing to decide one way or the other, yes, Trump is disqualified by Section 3 or no, he's not, that would have created a uniform national ruling. It would have happened to come up accidentally or arbitrarily from Colorado as opposed to Maine in terms of which case got there first. Um, and so there were sort of 50 different procedural routes um, given our federalist system, but all leading to the same a uh, single substantive answer that would have been the U.S. Supreme Court's authoritative interpretation under Marbury versus Madison, exercising its Article Three power of judicial review, and so that's a little different in my mind than um, the discretion that each state has over ballot access rules. They, the states don't have any discretion over the true meaning of Section Three. That's a federal issue, and so. I think the court kind of a little bit apples and oranges in terms of thinking about what was really chaos and 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 patchwork in this in this context. Um, again, you asked about uh, depriving uh, citizens of a state of their popular will. Yes, I worry about that. I personally do not like the electoral college, but but think about the ways in which states again not just looking at 1868, but currently have that power. Maine and Nebraska choose different ways to allocate their electoral votes than all the other states by allocating some of their electoral votes on the basis of um, you know, congressional districts. If you play around with those online electoral college calculators like I do, you can look at a, a not so um, unrealistic scenario that could end up in a 270, 268 result that could end up being, you know, monkeyed around if either Maine or Nebraska decided to switch to the method that every other state uses. They have that power now, whether we like it or not, 
between now and maybe October when the ballots start going out overseas for absentee ballots to decide what they want to do. And again, as Bush versus Gore said, they could decide just, you know, to heck with actually letting citizens vote. We'll just make sure that either Trump wins or Biden wins or whatever the states want. So we, we have this kind of odd presidential election system to begin with. I don't like it. Maybe the court doesn't like it. But, it, you know, that again, if we're deciding to figure out what are legal arguments versus what are political policy arguments, I'm afraid a little bit too much um policy wish thinking is what affected um, you know, the court's analysis here. Okay, now to getting to the heart of the, the, the matter. Um, as, as both you and, and Justin have pointed out, there are these other qualifications for being president besides uh, whether or not you're an insurrectionist, right? You got as age, citizenship, you can't have more than two terms as Justin mentioned. All of those presumably are enforceable by Congress without prior legislation. It's not a 14th Amendment issue, so we're not talking about Section 5 legislation, but but no legislation is needed. Again, we, we haven't had the need to look at electoral votes cast by a state and say, uh-oh, you know, Obama tried to get electoral votes for the third time. He he can only get them twice. And so we can't count them or we can't let him be president the third time. What do we do? But that would be a judgment for Congress to make as it receives and counts the electoral votes under the 12th Amendment in that special joint session of Congress, which normally is re routine, but unfortunately was such a horrific event last time. Um, the 12th Amendment needs to be enforced. The 20th Amendment needs to be forced, which talks about what to do if a president-elect has not qualified. Um, and Congress clearly has power to, to, to figure that out. Doesn't it, it can pass legislation and we have the presidential line of succession, but you know, Congress has to make the judgment about whether or not we have a president-elect who is eligible to serve. And so one of the huge unanswered questions which you were alluding to, Chris, is, is that alternative mechanism, which is available for all these other qualifications, also available for the Section 3 issue? Or has the court tried to say, no, there's something extra special about Section 3 that Congress has to act by legislation ahead of time for this one thing when it doesn't have to do it for others? And if I can just make one more point about that and why this is such a tricky issue, as Justin mentioned earlier, the court's ruling applies to all federal officers, not just the presidency. But the court acknowledged that there's a separate provision of the Constitution in Article I, Section 5, which gives each chamber of Congress the final authority to say, to, to review the results of elections for that chamber and the qualifications of members to that chamber. And so, and in fact, with respect to the Section 3 issue, back at the time of Reconstruction, without federal legislation on the books yet, the, the, the chamber said, no, we're not going to seat this senator elect or we're not going to seat this representative elect because they're insurrectionists who were, you know, Confederate traitors. And the court acknowledges that at least as to that, um, that's not the kind of plaintiff lawsuits that Justin absolutely correctly said the court wants to rule off limits. That's Congress enforcing Section 3 through a different mechanism. It's okay for Congress to do that for congressional elections, but the big thing left open is, is it okay for Congress to do that with respect to presidential elections? And to directly answer the question you asked me, Chris, I think you can read the opinions that we've got in opposite directions on this key point, because I think there is left in the per curiam lots of language that suggests that what the court really wanted to say was to tie Congress's hands here and say, you can only do this through Section 5 legislation that passes the so-called um, congruence and um, proportionality standard under the Bernie case. Um, and you know, if it's not congruent and proportional, we're not going to accept it. And I think that's what got the progressives really upset. I think probably some of that language was taken out, but a lot's left in. And the dissent itself reads as if 
the court is trying to tie Congress's hands in that way and says you can't do it except through legislation. On the other hand, what's left in the per curiam isn't that explicit. They don't talk about the 12th Amendment. They don't talk about the 20th Amendment. They talk, don't talk about the new Electoral Count Reform Act, which is a statute, which is legislation. It's not specifically 14th Amendment Section 5 legislation, but it's arguably section, uh, legislation that would allow Congress to enforce all presidential qualifications. So the fact that they don't address it at all, I think one can say by implication is they leave in place powers that Congress has, and Congress with, prior to this opinion would have been understood to have those powers. So I, I can argue that both ways. I think good law students could write exams that would argue it both ways. And, and unfortunately the court has left the country fraught with, I think, a perilous un uncertainty because to your point, yes, it's a legal issue and the court, the Congress should re respect the court's determination of a ruling of constitutional law. But if if, Cong if the court doesn't answer that key question, it becomes a political matter for members of Congress to decide what they're going to do, given that ambiguity. And I'll just, if I can, add one note to all, I agree with every word that Professor Foley just said. Um, but one conclusion you can draw from that is that regardless of the votes, Congress or the court's going to have the last word. And I don't I, I don't want to put words in Professor Foley's mouth. I want to say that I don't uh, believe that's actually as a as a legal matter that may be true. As a practical matter, I don't believe that's a realistic possibility. Um, there is a there's a momentum to tens of millions of people actually casting ballots. And I think if uh, Donald Trump doesn't win the election outright in the Electoral College. I think it is this this question goes away, right? This question is isn't relevant. If Donald Trump does win the election legitimately by winning a number of states equal to a majority of the Electoral College, um, then I find it very hard to believe that Congress would take steps, no matter how warranted, to undo that through acting uh, in order to disqualify the president-elect, right? The, the, the country will at that point have spoken and that's going to inform not only what future members of Congress think, I mean, remember the, the Congress elected in 2024 is the one making this decision, not the one sitting right now. Um, but I think even if you take the present members of Congress, a lot of them would have a really hard time, no matter how warranted they might think it is in the abstract, no matter how warranted they think it might be in the facts now, no matter what they may have thought about disqualifying the former president three years ago, I think a lot of members of Congress would have serious second thoughts about being perceived to overturn um, the results of the, the election as it conveyed through the Electoral College. And I just I I think that's right as a as a predictive matter of the politics of this, as a normative matter, uh, apart from whether or not Congress has the legal power to do it, I think it would be unfair to the voters. I think the time for disqualifying Trump was you know, now as as obviously Colorado tried to pursue it, the court did what it did. You know, Congress in theory could enact the, the kind of statute that the court is calling for here, but that, as a practical matter, that's not going to happen with uh, uh, the, the the current Congress. Uh, the, in, in a way, the time, you know, we, we can look back, you know, assuming that, that you know, we're all going to be in a position 10 years from now to, to think that, you know, we, America, the ship of state, the Republic navigated through these treacherous waters that we're living in right now. We'll look back and say, you know, there was a moment to that could have disqualified Trump during the impeachment trial, the second impeachment, if he had been convicted by 67 votes in the Senate then, that would have allowed Congress to disqualify him from future office without thinking about Section 3 separately or any other separate procedure. That's another congressional procedure, by the way, besides Section 5 legislation that, that can enforce 
Section three, in the sense that the that the impeachment uh, trial was all about insurrection and whether or not Trump was responsible for that. But so Congress didn't do that. Um, I, in one of my Washington Post columns, Chris, that you mentioned, that I've been fortunate to be able to to write uh, back in twenty early in 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 twenty twenty two, I urged Congress to pass this kind of statute to try to get ahead of the curve so that we wouldn't be in the predicament that we're now in. But you know, Congress was busy doing other things and so forth, and we are where we are. So I, I do think it would be unfair to voters to say, kind of gotcha to overturn the result the way Justin's talking about. And on the other hand, I think the anti-Trump or never Trump movement in American politics is so strong whether you agree with it or disagree with it, that there are there is going to be pressure if he does win the Electoral College, particularly if he doesn't win the overall national popular vote, which has no legal meaning, but has a kind of moral authority to it. For There are going to be people who are going to say it's going to be intolerable that he hold the Oval Office again. People have said that already. Think of all the statements that Liz Cheney has said about we can never let this man anywhere close to presidential power again. You know, what is she going to say on this issue if, in fact, he he wins? I, I think we're going to have a public discourse in this country if he does win in November, between November and January, that it's going to be fraught. Um, you know, President Biden is going to have to give some kind of concession speech. I, I can't imagine writing that after a campaign that's basically been about the soul of the nation and he, the reason why he's he ran the first time, the reason why he's running again is to is to protect the country from a second Trump term. And he said that he didn't think the country could survive a second Trump term. So there will be advisors or members of his party that will try to get him to have a, a concession speech that gives him an out if Congress were to, you know, to to exercise Section three. Does he attempt to nip that in the bud and repudiate that? That's going to matter immensely. And there's a lot of political dynamics in play that I think have been left open by this uh, decision and, and sort of how it unfolds, um, as you say, Chris, is more a political matter than a legal matter at this point. And I'll add just one more. Uh, I'm sorry. No, Chris. please, please, please. Uh, uh, one more. I think it's in the, in the category of an imponderable because I don't think it has practical effect, but it's a curiosity of this process so far. So I agree that the right time to have done this was three years ago. Um, and I don't think that precludes other times to do it, but the the proper time to have done this was three years ago. And the weird thing is Congress kind of did, even as it most definitely did not. Um, so in the impeachment, the one of the questions on the table is, did Donald Trump engage in insurrection and should he be disqualified from holding office? Again, that was one of the counts, was essentially a count under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And the curiosity of the process is that we have a vote expressing the views of a majority of members of Congress, more than half of the House and more than half of the Senate, saying as a factual matter, they think he's disqualified. Now, that doesn't have immediate legal effect. The impeachment, exactly as Professor Foley says, requires two thirds. It's a little bit like in a criminal trial, getting a factual finding from the judge without having a conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. And we don't get that. There's a really good reason that we don't have that process of having interim factual findings along the way. The jury sort of makes a final determination and it's only that final determination matters. Um, but here we've got a process where we can see a vote count letting us know what more than half of the Senate believes, even though it didn't get a sort of clean shot at answering that question outside of the context of impeachment. And that's weird. And it's not entirely clear what, if anything, should be done with that. It has no legal effect, but it's a fact that uh, that exists and won't go away anytime soon. And one that seems to be precluded by the court's opinion as a mechanism for using the Section 3 power. It, if, if we do require actual legislative activity in the sense of drafting and debating and passing legislation, that would seem not to count. But as you rightfully said, Professor Levitt, there is the sense of the Congress that Section 3 would therefore prohibit uh, yeah, and every piece of 
of what you said correctly. They said legislation, but as Professor Foley points out, unclear whether they mean it because the legislation you don't need in any other context. And also here, it's very clearly dicta, right? That's part of what the, the concurrence is so angry about. But the, the notion that they mentioned legislation has nothing to do with and is not in any way necessary to resolving the case before the court this time around. Yeah. I want to ask one more question before we open it up to the audience for their thoughts and reflections. This is a pretty big one, and I'm going to ask each of you to take a stab at it. And in, in an overview sense of Trump v. Anderson, what does the case mean for the role of the court in protecting the Constitution democracy and the rule of law. Is Justice Barrett's, again, short concurrence, a reminder that the court was unanimous in its basic ruling? Was that valuable in trying to calm things down and lower the national temperature? Or was it way too optimistic, masking real troubles that may lie underneath the surface among the nine justices? Uh, Professor Levitt and then Professor Foley. Uh, so I'll say both. Um, I think it was valuable in pointing out the areas of agreement and pointing out that this was unanimous on the question of could Colorado do what it did, and that is helpful. Um, I think that there are times in our history where the court has taken it upon itself to be the decider not only of individual legal issues, but resolving big political and moral questions, and the court has failed at almost every circumstance when it's tried to take on that role. And so I don't think that that's what Justice Barrett was trying to do, but to the extent that the court was trying to weigh in to settle a, a, a dispute dividing the nation politically at the moment, um, I think it doesn't have the tools up to the task, and I think probably knows that it didn't have the tools up to the task. That's one of the reasons I suspect that even though the court had the capacity to decide the substantive question of did the former president engage in insurrection and is he disqualified? That's one of the reasons why no justice showed any appetite in actually engaging that question. And I guess um, I'll, I'll add to what Justin said by there's, there's another essay that's worth reading that doesn't take too long to read it. And this one's in the Atlantic by Professor Tribe from Harvard and former judge Michael Ludig, um, who previously urged the court to disqualify Trump um, and and have written an impassioned response. You know, I, I went into reading that thinking I would probably not disagree and think or not agree with it, thinking that they maybe went too far in their rhetoric. But it, it's quite a powerful statement on on their part of, of why they think uh, the court um, really failed to meet the moment of what the nation, its, its democracy needed. So, you know, whatever you know, as students who are trying to really struggle with this question, Chris, which is the most important question, is to what extent can our legal system give us the kind of self-government that we want us to have? Uh, I think every student would be well served to spend the time to read what Professor Tribe and, and Judge Ludig say. And, and again, maybe Justin's right that maybe we can never rely on the court to do what we need to do for ourselves. I mean, the odd thing about the section three disqualification is it does limit who you can vote for. I mean, the, 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 the really difficult thing here is it's, it, if you think section three means what it says, that former insurrectionists uh, who betrayed their oath to subvert the constitution are not eligible for office again, even if a majority of citizens want to vote for them, that in a sense disables that elective choice. But it's a constitutional judgment made at the time that it's necessary to preserve the Republic itself. If we let people who betray the Republic back into office, even if we might, or part of us, our polity might want them, we risk losing our democracy itself. And so the question is, if, if you want the Constitution to have that kind of self-protective mechanism, who's supposed to enforce it? And if the court's judgment here is that, well, we can't enforce it, we're not strong enough to do so, at least not without sort of advanced con con congressional permission, that only leaves the people themselves to enforce it uh, by not voting for an insurrectionist. Um, and yet, 
leaving it that way is to um, divest section three of the power of being a constitutional provision that constrains even us under our own constitution, you know, for, from doing what we want. If I can just say one final thing on this, um, many students may remember fondly or not so fondly reading, you know, the Odyssey or, you know, about Ulysses back in high school. And did you remember the, the, the story of Ulysses needing to tie himself to the mass so he couldn't hear the siren song because anybody who heard the siren song would, would go and, and that would doom them. The constitution in a way, and a lot of provisions is tying Ulysses to the mass. It's saying we can't violate people's religious rights. We can't violate for, uh, free speech rights or other rights, even if we, the democracy want to. That's the counter majoritarian nature of constitutional protections. And section three may be the most important one. We can't vote for someone who would destroy our own system. But the court kind of has unleashed Ulysses from the mast, and it means Ulysses has to be able to protect himself from the siren song. I think that's where we are. There's one more actor who could use the rope. It's just that we've given up on them because they failed miserably, and that's Congress, right? The, <laughs> that They were supposed to be the adults in the room, uh, and we count on them in the first instance. The court is at least counting on them in the first instance. I think that the framers of the 14th Amendment had a very different view of how Congress would act in situations like these than the present Congress is capable of acting. And and that, unfortunately, uh, has has set up exactly the problem that Professor Foley recounts. Uh, one last comment from me, which is that Professor Foley has been shouting out lots of great essays and pieces that are available in print and online. Um, but no surprise, he is not shouting out his own recently published essay in Lawfare. So I will do that and highly recommend to everybody in the audience that they have a look. Was It was published yesterday. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So uh, m even more thoughts on topics and questions that we didn't get to in this conversation. Uh, but as promised, the floor is now open to all of you, I'm going to start with an online question, which is how do you reconcile section three of the 14th amendment not being self-executing while the other sections are? So I don't, uh, I'll start with this, it's a great question. Um, I don't think the court decided that section three was not self-executing. And the clearest way you know that is it said states can execute section three without any further action by Congress tomorrow, right? So just with respect to state officers, not federal officers. I don't think it was deciding a question that is about whether there needs to be something else to execute, to, to, to press go, to turn on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Instead, it was making a call, the court was making a call about who the proper decider would be, who would apply the already executed standards in Section 3 to particular individuals. And if the individual happens to be a federal office holder, it says we need a federal body to do that. We need Congress to do that. But the fact that the states can enforce Section 3 today, and have, by the way, um, against people who are seeking state office, not only in the mid-19th century, but relatively recently, there was a county commissioner in New Mexico who was denied the opportunity to hold that office again because of his- I just have to say that person's last name is Griffin, and there is no relation whatsoever. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, it's true. Griffin shows up an awful lot in, in the context of this case, it's actually, Clay Griffin and Griffin's case and all throughout. Um, so it's a it's an esteemed lineage you've got. Uh, no, there, there is obviously uh, no relation, but it shows that there doesn't need to be congressional action to enforce Section 3. It's already been enforced plenty. Um, the question is about who the decision maker is. Anything to add, Professor Foley? No, I think that's great. Let's... Um... Let's let's have other questions if there's time for it. How about here in room 164? Everyone very shy on this dreary Friday afternoon. Ah, we do have uh, from uh, Dean Cohen. Does the court's decision hold any lessons for lawyering in blockbuster cases like this one? Oh, so great. I've got my answer, but I really want to hear. I really no, want to no, go, go, Justin. I, I want to. <laughs> so 
I think it does, but I, I don't, I think actually it's a beautiful question uh, in part because I think Professor Foley and I are going to disagree on this. Um, my answer is be careful of the cases that you bring in the first place. And I think this is a great object lesson in that. Um, I actually had spoken with the plaintiffs in the case in Colorado, uh, or the plaintiff's attorneys rather, um, and asked them not to bring this case because I saw, I, I, I foresaw this is the most probable of options, not the particular legal rationale that the court gave, but the, the best you could hope to accomplish would be an assertion by this court, not about the merits, but that a particular state couldn't take this action. There were a lot of reasons. We haven't even gotten to all of the other off ramps the court could have taken, right? The 14th Amendment, Section 3 says uh, you can't hold office. It's not about electing a candidate to office. Congress can remove that disqualification. If you don't put somebody on the ballot, we don't ever have a chance for Congress to remove that disqualification. Um, this case was about the primary process, which isn't really about qualifications of candidates anyway. And, and parties have First Amendment rights to decide who they want to hold as their nominee. And, 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 and there are lots of other ways the court could have gotten to a similar result, which is to say, you can't do that here. And I thought that the most probable reaction was you can't do that here. I also thought, I'm happy to say, I don't think it's been misread as I feared, um, which is a decision by the Supreme Court saying you can't do that here, being read as validation um, of the former president or being read to say that they, they decided something on the merits that they didn't actually decide. I was quite worried that the decision would come out and it would be celebrated for things it didn't say. Um, but I didn't see a plausible shot at achieving the legal result that the plaintiffs were seeking. And for me, that's part of the lesson in lawyering, no matter how compelling the question, um, think about the results that you may be getting and both the downsides and the upsides of that. And whether it's pro more probable you'd be steering into downsides than upsides is a hard lawyering lesson. And one that I, I don't know that the plaintiffs appreciated as, as fulsomely as I would have hoped in this case. Um, that said, there were a lot of very smart people who were hoping that the court would decide the substantive question about whether the former president was, uh, in fact, engaged in insurrection and disqualified. And so not everybody's going to agree with me on the consequences here. So, um, yeah, it's a really great question. Um, and I, I think Justin is right in general. It's, it's important to ask yourself, do you really want to bring a case before you bring it? And are you prepared for a negative results, especially uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court, if it's going to get there, as this one likely would? Uh, on the other hand, in this instance, I don't really fault the plaintiffs for 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 trying. Again, uh, you know, once there wasn't the kind of legislation that Congress could have adopted, uh, but wasn't going to do so after the twenty uh, two midterms. Um, you know, if 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 one sincerely believes, as Liz Cheney and others do, that you know, Trump is a, is a unique threat, then you, you try whatever you can try and do the best you can. And I, and I think for law students, um, what's really valuable about this case is it was really well argued in the U.S. Supreme Court on both sides. Um, neither, you know, the, the plaintiffs, they might have lost 9-0 in a way, but not for lack of really great briefing. Their briefs were great and their argument was great for someone who I think had not had prior oral argument experience in the U.S. Supreme Court, had been a, had argued in other courts and I think had clerked there. But that shows, you know, you don't have to have been around the block 27 times to do a great job. If you do your homework, you think hard, you, you do your moot courts and stuff, you can stand up there and 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 make the best possible case as as he did, um, and likewise whether you you're pro Trump or anti Trump, his lawyer did a phenomenally good job arguing the merits of that side of the case. So as a country, I think we should be grateful for the fact that a case this important was was well briefed. And again, full disclosure, as someone who participated in an amicus brief, <laughs> whose position was not accepted by the court. I still feel good about the fact that we wrote the brief that we did. I, I think I, I like our brief. And ultimately, it's our responsibility as lawyers to do the best job we can to present our arguments to the court. 
And that's why the justices are 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 the justices. We're not they. They are they have that unique position and um they hold the responsibility for making the decision based on everything that's put before them. So I think in that sense, we should feel good about our legal process, even if we might not like the particular result reached here. Uh, Dean Cohen has a follow-up question uh, asking, what should we make of the fact that the court decided the case on a ground that no party advanced? <laughs> nine people in robes do what nine people in robes do. I mean, that's, that, that is, uh, not particularly surprising in a case of this magnitude that the court would decide how it wanted to to resolve this case um in other cases you know you might see well we don't agree with any of that but we're going to send it down for further development or a request for rebriefing or re-argument or something like that the court does that when it's not satisfied with any of the um the facts presented to it sometimes or the legal theories presented this case, as as we both mentioned, needed to be resolved in a hurry. The court knew that. And I think it's in that context, it's not particularly surprising that the court said, we're going to give you an answer, even if nobody's really teed up the answer in front of us now. I think it missed a lot of issues. Uh, it kind of not only decided a question on a, on a legal theory that nobody had advanced, it decided a different question than was presented. Um, and by that, I mean, the state didn't say it was enforcing Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. It said it was protecting its own voters from voting for a candidate who might down the road be disqualified. And so uh, trying to safeguard its own voters from casting a ballot that would be nullified. Um, the court didn't decide that question because that wasn't the pressing question gripping the country. It kind of reached out to, to decide a slightly different question than that. And I'm not particularly surprised by that either, given the context. Just a quick follow up on that, you know, I wanted to mention earlier in the conversation that they say very clearly at the beginning of the opinion that the question on which cert was granted was, quote, did the Colorado Supreme Court err in ordering President Trump excluded from the 2024 presidential primary ballot? Right. All the things we've been talking about are obviously in response to that question, but that question is so capacious as to have lots of different ways to answer it. Did they err by taking authority constitutionally that they didn't have? Did they err in finding that he was an insurrectionist when he didn't qualify as one? Um, uh, perhaps the open-ended nature of that question gave the court the room to do exactly what they did, as you said. Um, any, I'm gonna check in the room before I go back to, to Zoom. Very good. The next Zoom question. Is it fair to view the, this ruling as opposite to the history of incorporation? For example, um, I'm going to take this as federal government tried to limit state rights in accordance with the Bill of, a Bill of Rights, but federalism prevailed until incorporation. Now it seems like the court is preventing a state from exercising a right in the federal constitution. I imagine a situation where federal legislation actually disqualified Trump, but then the court might rule that it's inconsistent with federalism. Do you have any thoughts on that? So really interesting question. I, I, one that deserves more thought that I'll have can do justice to it in, in today's session. I guess I think um, if I understand it exactly, the, it goes back to the earlier point about this tension. There is internal tension in the federalism uh, resolution of the 14th Amendment in multiple respects. As many law students uh, who've taken constitutional law may remember there was there was a case shortly after the adoption of the 14th Amendment called the Slaughterhouse Cases, which interpreted the Privileged Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment extremely narrowly uh, in a 5-4 decision. So it wasn't like open and shut. And as a consequence, it left the 14th Amendment that we exist as a practical matter different from arguably what it was set up to be originally. And you can, and depending upon what you think about slaughterhouse and the privilege immunities clause, affects your judgment on incorporation because incorporation happened through the due process clause, which was sort of odd when it privileges immunities made more sense. So, when we colloquially use the term fourth the Fourteenth Amendment, especially all the parts of Section One, like equal protection clause and and due process, and what's left of privilege immunities. 
I think as lawyers, we think about the corpus of that as it's evolved over the last 150 years with lots and lots of Supreme Court precedents, Brown versus Board of Education, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we're going through something of a revolution of interpretation uh, on that in terms of the Second Amendment isn't just the Second Amendment, it's the incorporated Second Amendment. And so how Section 3, which hadn't been addressed by the Supreme Court before, and how it gets treated in terms of federal state relations, I think it's really hard to fit together with the totality of what we know about state and federal relations under, under the section one of the 14th Amendment. Um, so it's really important question, but I, I, I'm interested in what Justin has to say. I, I don't think we really know the answer to it yet until we see the rest of the 14th Amendment unfold over the next decade or so. Yeah, I, I think in the area, I agree with what Professor Foley said. In You see the court over time. I like to talk about con law as distinct from the other classes that you may get in law school, not as distinct as this is going to draw out, but some of the other classes are more like um, riding a train and you're on the rails and you decide where the stops are. And some of the classes are more like driving a car. It gives you a little more freedom and flexibility, uh, but there's still roads and there's still stop signs and there's still lights and you still turn. Um, you still got to drive between the curbs at some point. And con law is a little more like sailing. Um, there are ways to do it wrongly. It's not that there are no rules, but it's much more flexible. And the trick is to watch for the tides more than anything else. And the way the winds are blowing may be a, a more apt metaphor than I've realized. Um, the court has really struggled with shifting tides of federalism over time. And you see opinions that put a heavy thumb on the scale for the federal government and opinions that put a heavy thumb on the scale for the state governments. And sometimes they waffle in between. You see this in the court's uh, decisions on Commerce Clause Authority. You see it in the decisions on the 10th Amendment. You see it in the electoral zone in particular um, with Bush versus Gore and the various opinions in Bush versus Gore. You see it in Shelby County. And they're not all consistent with each other. Um, different tides have, have run in different powers with different courts. Um, some are stronger, some are less strong. And I think this was a resolution of the particular issue before the court, very strongly, again, not wanting uh, different states to resolve in different ways the question of a major party candidate's uh, appearance on the ballot. Um, but I don't know that that I would expect it to be, and I don't know that it is consistent across the board with all of the court's other federalism jurisprudence. It's, it's hard to draw that line in, in one straight direction. I love the sailing metaphor, Justin. Can I can I borrow that for my students? <laughs> All yours. <laughs> Very good. Well, I'm keeping an eye on the clock, and we only have one minute remaining in the formal program, so I will use my discretion and and end the Q and A there. Uh, Justin Levitt, thank you for joining us in this conversation. Uh, Ned Foley, thank you not only for today but for your prior discussion about Trump v. Anderson before the oral arguments. Thank you for being here as a distinguished visitor at the College of Law. Thanks to everybody here in Room 164 and online for your great questions. Um, have a great weekend. Thanks. Glad to be with you all. Yep, that was great. Thank you.